Angela Cross. I am the founder of Fierce Fearless Sisterhood. And the month of May is Trauma Awareness Month. And I believe it is also Mental Health Awareness right Month, which go hand in hand. And so I really wanted to bring someone on to discuss trauma, mental health, how it affects us, how to recognize it, and really how to heal from it. So joining me live and in person uh, is healing coach, Miss Wendy J. Olson. She is the founder of Great and Gumption Farmstead. She is a warrior woman. She is a mother of two. She's a chicken mama. <laughs> Um, I just adore her, but she, I've learned so much about trauma and its effects on our bodies, and she's touched so many women. She is um, such an advocate for really everyone, the underdog, and so I'm excited to, that you're here with me, Wendy. I'm excited that we're live. Um, so that was my little spiel, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm sure you'll say it much more eloquently <laughs> than I did. I feel like that was perfect. I feel like we're good. Like, I feel like, I don't know, what else could I add to that? Um, I have a dog and a tortoise, like if that matter. <laughs> um, I will say that our nonprofit um, does provide retreats and therapeutic services for survivors of sex trafficking and domestic violence. So there, that's all I'll add to that. Okay, hold on really quick. I want to add, I need to tell my other audience that Facebook Live was not working, I just realized. So. No, it was not, and we are sorely disappointed in that, but that's okay, because Instagram's working. So I'm excited to be here. I'll just say that I mm -hmm. just, I love, <laughs> I'm a nerd and I love to talk about trauma <laughs> for fun, mm -hmm. for funsies. Um, I do a weekly uh, clubhouse chat on Wednesdays, 11 to 12 Central Standard Time, where we talk about all things trauma. We talked about for the month of May, what is trauma? Um, what is, why do we have to go back to our past in order to right. heal? And then the last two weeks we did, this is your body on trauma and this is your brain on trauma. So, um, a little bit about that. So I've just been chatting it all up. I'm to a total psychology nerd. I'm an autodidact. So I love like diving into all those things and learning just really on my own terms. For some reason, that's what, that's what fascinates me. So I'm honored that you asked me to be a part of this discussion and I'm ready to dive in. Awesome. So yes, let's go ahead and dive in. And let's just start with the basis. Now, for those of you who are watching who know everything about trauma, I think that's amazing. Everyone should know everything they need to know about trauma, considering that we all experience it in some form or fashion. But this is just a general overview um, to get people talking and to get people thinking. So let's start with the basics. What is trauma? How can you sum that up? There's so many things, but in your own words, how can you sum that up? Well, I like, love a good definition, so let's start there. Trauma is defined as a deeply distressing or disturbing event or physical injury. Um, I think when we're talking about trauma, and, and this way we're not talking about the physical injury, we're talking about more of a moral inner, um, injury, an emotional injury, things of that nature. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today, but that's it just a good definition place to start. Okay. And how can we recognize or identify trauma in our life? I know that just like off the top of our heads, we have a lot of people who may say, and I know, you know, I even think that way sometimes we like, oh, I'm fine. And so we think it's like, I, I was never, I don't know, I didn't experience a sudden tragic, you know, accident and my legs were cut off or I didn't experience, you know, domestic violence. Or just, we think like the grandest thing, you know, I wasn't in war, war where there are bombs falling. So how can we identify trauma in our own life? I think we have to take it back and say that everyone has suffered a trauma. And if you think about it this way, um, everyone has died a death. 
experience at some point in their lives that has completely altered and changed the way that their life was going. So Bessel van der Kolk says that trauma interrupts the plot. We're going along just fine. And then bam, there's a huge wall, a boat, a flying fish, I don't know, whatever is like in our way and it's disrupting us from moving forward. Now we can't continue down that path anymore. So we take a left, we take a right, we go diagonal, maybe we go backwards. So it's just an interruption, right? Everyone collectively is likely dealing with undealt with trauma. That, let's just say that's a given. Um, in one fashion or another, you're living with undealt with trauma in your life. Um, let's take the pandemic, for example, okay? This is an example of a collective trauma. And we're quickly seeing the results of that collective trauma spill over into our streets, literally and figuratively. We're Absolutely. running into people that, uh, you know, throughout the summer, spring, winter, fall, we're seeing just more anxious people, more angry people, more people just be acting out um, aggressively more than normal. This is because we're all suffering a collective trauma together. Um, so we're seeing the actual effects of that trauma right now um, added on top of the trauma that people are already living with. So people, you know, like I said, seem more anxious. Maybe they're more snippy. Um, mm -hmm. There's a great quote I heard on Adam Young's podcast, and it says, the past isn't dead. It's not even past. So, like, if you haven't dealt mm -hmm. with the things in your past, then trust me, they're dealing with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we see that in different ways. It's going to come out sideways. It's going to come out one way or another. You can only shove it down so long before it just seeps out the sides. Right. So your past and your willingness to deal with your past is and will dictate your present and in turn your future if you choose to do nothing about it. Yes. Because it literally will come out physically. Um, it shows up. It's Like you said, it spills out. It, it bursts into everything. So that's my next question. Let's talk about how it does that. It's the effects on our bodies because... If we can safely say that stress has a physical, emotional, we know that, but yet physical effect on the body, you know, stress is usually a result of some sort of trauma, whether from our past or even ongoing. So let's dive deeper into that. Um, I remember, let me read a, a passage really quickly. Um, this is a quote from um, Bessel van der Kolk, the, the author of The Body Keeps the Score. And it says, um, traumatized people chronically feel unsafe inside their bodies. The past is alive in the form of gnawing interior discomfort. Their bodies are constantly bombarded by visceral warning signs and in an attempt to control these processes, they often become expert at ignoring the gut feelings and numbing awareness as it is played out inside to hide from themselves. And so when I hear that, it, it, it makes me think that like, you know, sometimes so much of the effects of trauma is going on in our body so much and we've suppressed it so much to just go on in life that we really are not in tune with ourselves and it will continue to go on until it is almost like an emergency and an alarm um i have a, had a friend who just really experienced um an issue with like um, her heart racing and she didn't know why actually i'm not even going to use that friend as an example i was actually experiencing that at the end of last year and i kept being like is this i'm having heart issues i never really addressed it to just the anxiety of the pandemic, the anxiety of just all the new protocol and rules and regulations. And I'm an educator by day. So just the stress of trying to keep little ones safe. And I kept being like, why am I, my heart is racing. Like I literally, you know how you feel like after you've worked out really hard, I could just be like sitting still. <laughs> and at the end of a day's work, Feeling that way, just out of the blue, my heart is just like racing out of my chest. And so let's talk about that, just ways that it shows up and why. So I think our bodies are these amazing gifts, right? Like they, we are created, I personally believe we are created 
and we have everything that we need and we can learn things along the way, but we can bless our bodies and say, these bodies are good. Okay. It's just yeah. everything else gets in and tells us we're wrong. We can't trust our gut. We can't trust ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can't trust our thinking, except our brains are doing things to protect us in survival yeah. mode all the time. So even my thinking it is, is pretty good if it's teaching yeah. me how to survive. And it does repress memories from uh, early childhood wounds, early trauma, um, just so you, you're able to keep going. And, um, but eventually, like my friend Lori says, eventually the bill comes due. Eventually yeah. you're mid deep in your thirties. You've got little ones running around and your the stress boils over and suddenly you can't figure out why the whole right side of your body is going numb and you're like, you suddenly developed a twitch or something. Yeah. Your body can only take so much. And if it hasn't been able to fully process and complete the trauma, then it is stored and trapped inside your body. So our bodies hold trauma. You've heard that probably heard the term holding, right? Yeah. If you think of like the stress of like, Oh, my shoulder's always hurting for me. It's always my right hip, you know? Whatever that, that looks like. I have fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. That's PTSD of the body in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But there, it's going to come out in different forms health-wise, uh, physical health. Yeah, that's going to be the – that's the last alarm to go yeah. off. You've already had several, and now this is the last one to go off. And you better pay attention to this because it, it's literally going to bring you down. Absolutely. You know – I think of the way back when in, in college I was a biochemistry major and we would really talk about how the body is just basically one big, I don't want to say chemistry experiment because God wasn't experimenting, but just like a chemical reaction is a better word for it. And just as our physical bodies will heal themselves, you know, you get cut and then the cells immediately know we need to start regenerating, we need to start healing, all the blood is rushing to the area to try to work to try to heal it. Even when we go through, because our minds and our emotions are so powerful, even when we go through an injury that deals with our mind and our emotions, the body is immediately like heart racing. It's like that fight or flight response, like heart is racing, you know, uh, that it's the heart is pumping, the blood is rushing through to this area, you know, like you're so alert, like all of these things are happening. And it's like, however, if that response continues to happen over and over and over again, then that does damage over time to the heart, to the mind, to your nervous system. You know, um, I was reading a quote that says, your nervous system holds memories, you know, as well. And I think about that, um, you know, of like, let's say, um, children or or dogs or things the people that I, i've watched you know i deal with special education and students who have been like abused you know if they've been constantly hit and you do something like like a quick type of flinch of like i'm excited or give me a hug because they've experienced this trauma and their knee-jerk reaction is to like protect mm -hmm. themselves that's how they will respond to everything why because their nervous system their mind these neurons are remembering this trauma and it's an immediate reaction of survival versus, you know, someone who hasn't. And so I think uh, we have to really stop and be mindful and aware of what our bodies are telling us. I know for me, one of the big, my big things is clenching my fist. I'll really like, find that I clench my fist throughout the day and so but when I'm mindful I'll try to you know loosen up my body I pay attention to and my body is telling me it's under stress so I try to relax my fist take a deep breath and relax my shoulders but our body really do hold hold the trauma and the stress in I think about um how if we get a cut right the way that our bodies work is that the top layer heals first, right? The skin, mm -hmm. it's its job to close right away, mm -hmm. but the cut underneath is still healing. So when we experience trauma, our first response is our survival mechanism, which is going to kick into place. It's that reptilian brain that, that mm -hmm. says, we know how to do this. Like, we're going to take over. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but that so it's shutting it's it's taking it out of your rational brain and putting it in your survival brain yeah. and saying, this is what we need to do to, to keep going. This is what we need to do right. to keep surviving, not even right. thriving. And so mm -hmm. the healing layer is much deeper. It takes mm -hmm. a lot more time. More time. Uh, I think about like the way that you said, you know, the way children respond, that's um, PTSD. PTSD is mm -hmm. you're constantly constantly living in a state of trauma, believing that everything that comes at you is a threat. And that yeah. is a learned yeah. behavior that mm -hmm. a chemical in your brain, that it happened enough that it learned that this is, this is what happens. And so this is how we need to react. It's like autocorrect on your phone. You misspell a word enough times, mm -hmm. suddenly it thinks, oh, that's the word she means, whatever, you know, that's actually yeah. a chemical in our brain mm -hmm. that does that and says, you, when this happens, you will respond this way. And mm -hmm. the great part about our brains is there's neuroplasticity, which says we can unlearn things just the way that we did learn them. So there's mm -hmm. always hope for healing in that, which I love. Yes. So let's shift a little bit and go deeper and talk about attachment theory. Um, because our traumas, most of them are related to or connected to another person so absolutely can you give us a definition of attachment theory in my language man attachment theory is one of my favorite things to talk about um <laughs> so what is attachment theory okay um back up and talk about the different kinds of trauma and then go into okay. attachment theory or do you want because i kind of have like a whole like thing to say about that. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. I'm, a nerd. I'm a nerd. I love it. Okay. Um, so the different types of trauma and abuse would be like, we could start um, with the ones that people are very well aware of, right? Sexual abuse. Okay. This can be overt, namely sexual assault, rape, molestation, incest, etc. Or it can be more covert um, as in sexual suggestion, harassment. This mm -hmm. one's more insidious and hard to pick up on. And we've been conditioned mm -hmm. to believe that this is normal in a family of origin. Okay. And so we'll go back to like family of origin, the family that you grew up in. A great mm -hmm. book on sexual abuse is called The Wounded Heart. It is very triggering. Um, so just be aware if you ever decide, hey, I'm going to pick this up for a fun read. Don't. <laughs> be warned. He gives you no warning. He throws you in the deep end. Um, and then Healing the Wounded Heart, which I actually have here. Um, which is the second book. And Dan Allender says um, that everyone in one way or another has been sexually abused in their lives. Mm. Everyone. It just may not look the way you thought it would, even more if you're a woman, but equally if you're a man as well, even further if you're a person of color. In the mm. prologue to The Healing the Wounded Heart, Linda Royster um, writes a compelling argument that uh, racism is sexual abuse. Uh, mm -hmm. I highly recommend her work. She's amazing. Okay, we could now talk about racial trauma. Okay, the BIPOC community faces this every day as a result of living in this mm -hmm. country, period. Okay, without right. going into too much detail, we hold trauma inside our bodies from the trauma done to our ancestors. So uh, biologically, you existed in your mother's body when she lived inside your grandmother's womb. So you mm -hmm. and your grandmother existed at the same time. Because a woman carries all of the eggs she will ever produce in her life in her body when she's in the womb. Mm -hmm. So all that trauma that your grandmother held in her body, you consequently hold in yours. And a great book on that is um, My Grandmother's Hands by Resma uh, Menakin uh, on trauma, generational, and uh, racial. Amazing book. Love it. Um, we could also talk about sexual exploitation, but I feel like that's a totally other <laughs> conversation. Yeah. Um, there's physical abuse. That's pretty easy to describe. Emotional abuse um, or verbal abuse and gaslighting. I feel like that's a whole category in and of itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. When someone convinces you um, something that isn't, that's gaslighting. Um, the ex right. used to tell me that people didn't like me. Um, I, was a, I wasn't a likable person and that all of our friends were only his friends. And this will keep you isolated, which is what your abuser wants. Um, you won't reach out for help because you don't believe that anyone cares or likes you to begin with. Mm -hmm. So that uh, leads me into narcissistic abuse. 
And a lot of people are coming to know about this um, finally because they're able to name people as narcissists. I was only able to name narcissists in my life like two years ago. And because I listened to a podcast and I was like, that's not normal. That seems like that's exactly what happens in my everyday life. <laughs> well, wow. it, it does. So right. um, that person is a narcissist. I'm grateful for the language around it, but we have to be careful that we um, – follow people's rep reputable work in that because not everyone is a narcissist. Do we all have right. narcissistic tendencies? Sure. We're all selfish. Um, but that mm -hmm. doesn't make someone a narcissist. It's actually a personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a mental condition, which people have inflated sense of self, um, their own impor importance, uh, the deep excessive need for attention and mm -hmm. admiration. Um, they have mm -hmm. troubled relationships and highlight, they have a lack of empathy for others. Yes. So There's that's no important. Connection. Yeah. There's a great pro podcast on narcissism on Adam Young's podcast, which is uh, called The Place We Find Ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then the Allender Center also did a great series with Chuck DeGroat on um, narcissists in the church. Um, so a lot of great info on narcissistic abuse right now. Um, that leaves me spiritual abuse. Okay. Um, this is where someone uses the Bible or any kind of, um, you want to call it ancient text. I don't know like what another uh, word for that would be, but to ma manipulate and oppress someone else. So they're shifting the balance of power. It's off. This typically happens to women, but it isn't reserved just for us ladies. I've seen plenty of men out there that are actually giving voice to uh, spiritual abuse right now. And like, I'm here for it. Um, there's a fair amount of narcissism in the church as well um, that we're becoming more aware of. A good example of that is the purity movement and people speaking out against that right, right now as well. Um, last one that I'll talk about is neglect. Neglect is a form of abuse. Mm -hmm. You needed attention from a parent and they didn't give it to you. Parent or caregiver, whoever your primary caregiver was, whether that was physical or emotional, it was their job to give you both. Not one, not the other, mm -hmm. not just a roof over your head and food on the table, but hugs and comfort and attunement. They needed to see you well, and they didn't. Yeah. Okay. That brings me into attachment <laughs> theory. <laughs> Everyone got all the notes on that. Okay. That. Okay. So now I feel like we can open the door mm -hmm. um, to attachment theory. Um, this is where we find ourselves... Um, talking about the care that our primary caregiver gave us. Okay, attachment theory says there are two types of attachment as a result of the relationship that you had with your primary caregiver, whether that was mom, dad, grandparent, whoever that was. The two types are secure and insecure. Okay, secure means that you had someone um, that when you needed something, they gave it to you. Um, they didn't get it. They didn't nail it 100% of the time, but about half the time they got it right. Um, they attuned to you. Um, they knew what you needed without verbal language. Um, think of a mother who knows like which cry is which you're like, Oh, he's hungry right now. You know, um, you know, maybe she's tired, especially in that new newborn phase and she misses a cue, but the baby still knows that she can trust that her caregiver is there for her. The other type of attachment, insecure attachment has three subsets. Two of the most widely recognized and um, known are anxious and, or ambivalent, those go hand in hand, or avoidant. Um, a third that can also be added that has only been talked about in recent years is abusive attachment, um, which is kind of self-explanatory in, in that a baby grew up in like a hostile, abusive, chaotic home, and they have zero regulation for anything. Mm -hmm. They're always on high alert. They, they had PTSD very early on. And so that would be more of the description of a, an abusive attachment. Um, anxious or ambivalent attachment means that your caregiver only gave you attunement and care some of the time. You got better at reading them than they ever read you. Right. And so therefore... Kind of like walking on eggshells because you always, again, had to result back to that coping mechanism. Yes. To like get attention or, or do without. A hundred percent. Yes, you were reading them. Um, you ended up giving them more attunement than they gave you. Um, you find that, um, like, the, the way that that shows up for in, like, everyday life is you're constantly needing 
affirmation, you're needing reassurance, you're always asking your partner if they're okay. And you're very highly attuned to like everybody. <laughs> yeah. And because you're reading them, remember, you're reading everyone, like mm -hmm. all the time. So think of how exhausting that can be and right. is. Right. Okay. I have an anxious at attachment. Many people who are empaths likely have an anxious attachment because they learn from a very early age. I know, like I see you without like me having to communicate with you. Like I feel how you feel. It, it's a lot. Yeah. So an avoidant attachment says that you never got what you needed from your caregiver and you learned very early on that you only had yourself to rely on. So you're fiercely independent, you're not good at withstanding a relationship, and you mm -hmm. find people to be mostly too needy. Mm. Um, you avoid, much like the namesake, um, you're unable to attach properly to any other human being um, because people only let you down. And you don't let anyone get too close. So mm -hmm. here's where a good game of self-sabotage can come into play right? You're in a relationship, you have an avoidant attachment, everything's going great, there's smooth sailing, boom, you're going to mess it up because, whoa, they got too close, they needed something from you, you just, you can't, you always have to keep them at arm's length because people can't be trusted. Yeah. yeah. And I think that we all really have to take a look at that because I know even if you say, I had loving parents, I had, you know, Christian, whatever it is that, you, whatever it is that you esteem or have placed the pedestal you've placed your parents on, you still can find somewhere where you felt like there was a lack of attunement. Um, you know, my mother had eight kids. She loved all of us. She did the best she could. My mom is like, amazing went back to school with eight kids got a master's became a principal she's a minister I, I can go on and on and on she is my absolute hero however i can recall times under high stress where she might have been going through her own trauma where the attunement wasn't there you know where it was like her mind or or situation was took precedence at times over really be in a tune. So is this isn't, and even as a mom, we all can say as a mom, there are, are certain levels where we're, you know, weren't as attuned to our children. So it isn't anything when we say this, to our, you know, for our listeners, this isn't anything um, that you should pass over just because you feel a slight way about it as far as like, well, I don't want to judge my mom or I don't want anybody judging me. It's just part of life. We all experience stress. We all experience levels of trauma. Why? Because, uh, because life happens, you know? And so um, we have to look at that in order to really um, identify it within our own life, identify why we do the things we do, why we have certain behaviors. So I think that that's important. Um, and and you know, I think, I go think ahead. a lot of people have a problem with um, people that don't have close relationships with their parents are like, oh yeah, they messed up. You know, <laughs> like mm -hmm. we have no okay. problem yeah. being like that was wrong. Um, but right. people that are close to their family and have a, a certain loyalty will go to the excuse, well, I don't want to blame them. But actually it speaks to our own insecurity, especially when we become parents. I don't want my kids blaming me, but guess what? Yeah. You're, they're they're going to look at you one day and be like, mom, you messed up. Are you going to be humble enough to go back and say, yeah, I did. I fell yeah. short there. And right. the greatest thing I think that we've learned about attachment theory is that it can be healed. So you right. may have an anxious or ambivalent avoidant attachment with your child right now, but that right. doesn't mean 10 years, five mm -hmm. years down the road, you know, thank you God for the way that you wired our brains, our attachment theory, our mm -hmm. attachment style can heal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to say, like, we didn't get it right no, all the time. Say, like, the, the, um, there's this term that goes around with moms, like, I'm the yeller type of mom, you know? That is attachment and attunement right there. Like, if you are so stressed out that you are constantly yelling, okay, <laughs> your child is going to grow up likely doing the same thing 
or being hypersensitive and just kind of like avoiding conflicts because that is ingrained in it. It doesn't mean that you didn't turn around and say, I'm sorry. It doesn't mean you didn't turn around and go and kiss them at night and pray with them and just say, you know, look, mommy is under stress or whatever. So it's not anything to, uh, you know, feel shame about. Put I guess pile shame thing. on. Yes, yeah, 100%. Shame on. it's just awareness. It's just awareness so that when you, if you're still a parent, your child, you can look and say, okay, I need to be better at this because that's what I, I want to undo that. Mm -hmm. And if you are, um, an adult, you can look at your, you know, look at your relationship with your mom who may have done that or dad, um, and just be able to say, okay, because of that, this is why I do this. It is just bringing awareness. And the more that we understand our behaviors and why we do things, the easier it is to heal because we can recognize it. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned just, uh, that I started doing in the last probably year or so is instead of being upset and like keeping that to myself, um, I share that with my kids a lot. So um, this past month is a one year anniversary of something that uh, was really shaking in our family that was really hard. And I noticed myself being more agitated and like really activated, right? In my butt, like mm -hmm. I'm snippy, I'm short. I'm pulling on my phone all the time. I'm chewing the inside of my lip. You clench your fist. I chew the inside of my lip and just like, okay, I have to be curious about why I'm like this because those kids are not annoying all the time. Like clearly it's me after a while. Right. And I sat down and I told Melissa, I know I've been snippy. I know I've been anxious and I'm sorry for that. And I've also taught my kids not to reply. That's okay because it's not okay. Um, and yeah. I said, this is what's going on with me so that they understand that as adults, we still experience all those same emotions and mm -hmm. mental breakdowns and everything. from our trauma <laughs> while raising them and they'll be healing from, because here's the thing, even if you can't pinpoint any major trauma within the home, I mean, there is so much external trauma in this world. <laughs> Mm -hmm. To still be like, I am so sorry that now you have to heal as an adult from that. Um, you know, you brought up even earlier about racism. And, you know, my daughter just recently, we had an issue where um, she was playing outside with um, our neighbors. It's a, um, a little white girl, super sweet, you know, the family. But there were cops down the street and like a fire truck. And so her friend was like, oh my gosh, let's go see. That's so cool. Let's go figure out. Let's go whatever. And immediately my daughter got so worked up. You know, she came, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know this conversation was happening. She just comes through the door and she's crying and she's like, you know, this friend doesn't get it. She doesn't understand. And I'm like, what? What happened? And so she tells me how the friend suggests they go down and see, you know, be spies basically. And she's like, we shouldn't do that. That's not safe. But especially me as a black girl, like I don't run towards the police. I don't run towards, I don't view them as like, that's something fun to do or, you know, to figure out. And she was like, what do you mean? She's like, the police are safe. And they're having this conversation. These kids are nine and 10 years old. And it just goes to show you um, what I've had to speak to my daughters about what they've seen on television, what they've heard other adults say, just, just the climate of the country, you know, that's trauma on their little minds, trying to process this world, you know? And so it is, you know, let alone, um, you know, the killings of our black men and our black women and just all of those things while, you know, protesting, seeing all these things, like all of this is trauma, even if you're not a person of color, you know, again, I'm a teacher and so, these students have questions, you know, some of them, their parents talk to about some they don't and they want answers and their minds are processing. And so again, like that is a form of trauma because, um, I remember, um, a white male, uh, teacher, a friend of mine, he teaches junior high and all he did was pass out Black Lives Matter um, bracelets to his students. He was like, if you don't want it, no judgment, just say no thank you. And just that small gesture, the black students in his class bawling, just began mm -hmm. to weep because they felt seen, because they felt accepted in a place where they 
always, you know, when you're the minority in a lot of settings, you're always on guard, which is a mm-hmm. form of trauma, always having to be. And I remember that was hard for me to accept. I remember hearing, I think it was Lisa Harper mm-hmm. say, um, love her, right? Right. I have her books in right here, too. <laughs> this is a great book on trauma, too. Very good. Yes. Example. Very good. She is so awesome. Um, but she was talking about basically how we have to recognize that just being, you know, in certain settings, we're walking around with PTSD, we're on guard, we are careful of what we say, we're careful of how we act, we're careful of our, you know, surroundings, who's gonna misunderstand us. I mean, imagine, okay, you're already telling yourself this, and in order to be successful, in this, you have to, your mind is racing, your shoulders are tight, your heart is, you know, it's just on edge. Why? Because you are always on guard of just like making sure you say and do and you don't offend anybody and you don't, you know, like make them misunderstand who you are. And so just because of the color of your skin, and so that is a state of, of trauma that your body, you know, is in constantly. So you're um, living with I, a trauma response constantly. Right, yeah. Right. And your body is keeping that since a young child. Like I look at my daughter, okay, she's 10 years old. And so now like she's living that, you know what I'm saying? Um, and at such a young I, age, they don't have language. Right. That part right. of their brain is not developed yet. Right. And is not like most of those like rational parts are not, are, aren't even developed until your twenties. Right. <laughs> so, and that's true that you mentioned the language because what I did was I calmed her down. Um, <laughs> because I'm thinking of the other little girl too, and I'm like, okay, this is your friend. She's probably like freaking out, like, what did I do? Mm-hmm. And so I calm her down. I have a conversation about, okay, like I understand, and you you're right in the way that you feel about that. What I want you to do is be brave, and we talked about a certain terms she can use, and I want you to go course, kid-friendly language, go back to your friend and explain why you feel the way that you feel and that she didn't do anything wrong, but yeah. that that was your response be- as a result of how you view the world, you know? Um, and I even think of just things of like divorce, you know, I'm divorced and I think about just all the stress and trauma that goes with that and and the things that I went through and how I was just constantly (laughs) like your emotions are just spent going through that. And so having to heal from that so that I can be the best, you know, that I can be for my children. And so it is literally all around us. And so I guess my big message today is for people not to feel like, oh, well, that's not me or to judge people who have or to shame people who have, but to recognize we all literally have some some shape or form of it and to really be mindful and aware of it and how it affects us in our lives so that we can begin to live you know more in more freedom basically yeah um i want you to talk about how faith plays a part in healing um we know that we can you know go through therapy we know that we can get um you know counsel there's books to read there's podcasts and i really do want to touch on on our journey to healing but something you said earlier um you mentioned about you experienced trauma as you were an egg in your mother's womb while she was in her mother's womb and i couldn't help but think about what the Bible speaks of, like generational curse, um, you know, the iniquity and the transgressions being passed down from generation to generation, and how that, how, um, while people may or may not agree, the Bible recognizes trauma, you know, um, the Bible recognizes the effects on our emotions from this world, you know, I think of scriptures like, um, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and the sign. My God recognizes that there is fear, which is an emotion, yeah. you know? It's not something you can touch, and so it has an effect on us. Um, 
do not fear. I am with you. I will strengthen you, you know, in Isaiah. And so that says to me that it recognizes, God recognizes that it can make us weak. If it's saying that I can strengthen you, then that means you, it has an effect to weaken you, to weaken you physically, to weaken you mentally. Um, cast all your anxieties and cares upon me because I care for you, you know, um, we speak about anxiety all the time. And that's not to say that, like, all you need is just a good prayer and your problems are <laughs> solved. No, but it that's does. That's spiritual play abuse. <laughs> <laughs> right. It does play a part in just recognizing that we can't discredit faith either mm -hmm. in the process. So first, I want you to speak to how we can start our healing from awareness and the steps after that. And also tell me about your, um, cause I recognize not everyone watching will be Christian, but in your own faith, how it's played a part. So like you said, there's many avenues that you can take to start a journey towards healing, right? Personally, the method that worked best for me is what I use with my coaching clients now. And that's called story work. It's a Allender Center methodology that uses a narrative-focused trauma care. Um, we say that the story you tell yourself of what happened in your past isn't the true story. Um, mm -hmm. Once you get really serious about telling the truth of your story, you start to experience uh, the healing of that. Uh, but here's the trick, okay? The story we tell about what happened to us doesn't logically have to make sense. It doesn't even have to be accurate. Okay, mm -hmm. your feeling of that story is what matters. So that event, whatever it was, it mattered to you. Absolutely. So one of my favorite quotes of a Johnny Swim song, greatest duet of all time. <laughs> if it mattered, let it matter. If your heart breaks, then let it ache. And yeah. she actually wrote that song about her mother, Donna Summer, that died a few years ago. Um, because your body you're just like, you're fine. Get over it. That's, don't let it get to you, girl. You'll be okay, girl. You're this, you're that. You're awesome. You know, but we're we fighting each to, other at that point. Right. Because we're not allowing ourselves to feel all the feels. This is all a part of the human experience. Yes, I can declare the word and I get all of that. But at the end of the day, God recognizes that I am human, just as Jesus wept. <laughs> Just as, you know, he was under distress about going to the cross, like, we are human. And that is a beautiful thing to experience the highs and the lows of the emotions that he's allowed us, you know, to experience in this life. Well, and we're made in the image of God. He put everything in our bodies that is good. So even right. those emotions, those fears, those anxieties, everything in there, they're all good. Like they're all there for a reason, right? Absolutely. They may not be good for us. Like we don't want to live in fear, right? But mm -hmm. your body will tell on you every time. Every single time. When Absolutely. it comes to what the truth is, when it comes to what the truth of your story is. Right. We have this theory um, that's taught to us in the Allender Center that I absolutely love and just makes so much sense to someone like me who grew up in um, like a Southern Baptist church who likes like rules and good deeds. Cause that just makes sense. You know? <laughs> um, well, I don't ascribe to like the fundamentalist church anymore. I do believe that this is the most accurate depiction of healing that I can fully grasp onto. And it's called the you theory in it. We talk about the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. So the three days we have Friday uh, where Jesus dies and this is something as human beings that we all have experienced. You talked about your divorce. Divorce is a death. You lost something there. We've all experienced death. We know that death, ex death exists. We know that someone, we know someone that's died. Okay, so we've all in turn died a death as well. So whether that's big T trauma or little T trauma, we've all died deaths. We can accept that. Saturday is the day that not a lot of people talk about, but we have this Saturday experience of Jesus is gone, okay? His mm -hmm. disciples are like, WTF, what am I supposed to do now? You know, I left my career for this dude. Now he went and got himself murdered on a cross. Like, <laughs> what am I going to do? Okay, but we don't talk about this day too much because we're all looking forward to Sunday. We know the end of the story, right? Mm -hmm. We know that the mm -hmm. resurrection comes. 
We know it's there. We've heard the story a million times. Everything's great. Jesus lives. Hooray. You know, <laughs> but the reason the Saturday experience is so important is because it's the grieving period. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the time we don't know what we're going to do. Okay. Um, when you're walking through the steps of grief, um, you're going to have an identity crisis or three. <laughs> um, it's the, you know, let me take on a new project and completely eradicate my life just because I don't know who I am anymore. Um, it's the seven stages, uh, steps of grief or whatever, all the things. Um, the grief, the grieving, that's where the healing lives. Mm -hmm. And yes, we avoid the grief because it's too hard. Mm -hmm. And we right. don't know if and when, if and when we start crying and feeling all the feelings, mm -hmm. will it ever stop? How many times you can even be in a safe place and people are like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And they're quickly trying to console themselves because in a moment they feel out of control. And it's like, no, let that happen because while you're fearful and you feel out of sorts, your emotions will, as you release that, your emotions will regulate themselves. And so yes. we have to allow the grieving. We have to allow the cry, you know, all of that to come out. I, the best thing that was taught to me in the last couple of years is um, a, a therapist told me that feelings, if you let yourself feel them, will go away and reset themselves in 90 seconds. And yeah. I was like, what? I, I mean, I can do something for 90 seconds, right? <laughs> and I set my watch by like, okay, I'm only going to feel this way. And then if you let your body complete the process mm -hmm. of that feeling it will not every time but most likely nine times out of ten you'll be done in 90 yeah. seconds it will regulate itself just like it does physically with the cells the emotions will regulate you know and i think oh go ahead i think we're like you talked about someone crying in public i i think collectively as a society we've taught people that that's weakness and we don't yeah. want to see it. Right. Ooh, so we need so to reverse that yeah. and say, we welcome that. Because in other cultures, they do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they do. They allow weeping to go on for periods of time, actually. Yes. Yeah. They'll dress in mourning and all of those things. But you have to, like you said, I love that analogy of like, we've been crucified on Friday. And then you said we have to allow the Saturday of our lives to take place. The grieving, um, being wounded, sitting in it, sitting in that uncomfortable, I hate that this happened to me. I am so angry about mm -hmm. this to take place so that Sunday can come. You know, it wasn't like you're on the cross and bang, he's risen again. You have to die first. You have to die. And in death, you take your power back. And in death, you take your, take ownership of your story, I think. You know, sitting and acknowledging it, naming it. I mean, he's God. He could have been like, just kidding, I'm back, you know, already. But, like, mm -hmm. there's a reason why he gave it a few days. You know, right. like, everything he did was with intentionality. He didn't just walk around making small talk. You right. know, he, uh, straight to the, he's like, listen, I'm only here for this many more years. Like, let's get to the point. Let's get to the mean of it. So everything he did was on purpose. And so I have to believe that the burial, when we allow ourselves to be buried with Christ, like when we, um, when we experience baptism, right, we die and then we come back to life. Like, don't forget, like you don't just get in the water yeah. and then get back out. <laughs> right. There's the symbolism of the, the death and burial. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And I think that that's kind of, like you said, in society, we're taught to just be like, girl, you good, you strong, you got this, you know. And we have to recognize that, no, no, no. Go find someone that you have a safe, is a safe space with and grieve. Like, I remember even when I was in therapy and I went um, about my divorce, uh, I was shocked to hear that, uh, number one, divorce is a form of trauma. And then two, I was shocked to hear that it was a death, that it was like, you will go through the grief, like, you're like, going in denial. Like, I can't believe this isn't happening. This is mm -hmm. And then like, anger, like, I can't believe, 
oh, I'm just upset. And then like, you have to mourn the death of that marriage. And that is normal and that is okay. But we think that we, it's only like when people give you a rite of passage for if someone actually dies. But we have to, you may be mourning the death of a relationship with a parent and a strange, you know, or, or a toxic friend. You know, if you put hard work into something and it, un, it becomes undone, like we have to acknowledge the death in that. And we have to be okay with that, you know? And we have to allow people to grieve how they're going to grieve, not yeah. how we expect them to grieve, not yeah. how we think they should grieve. And yeah. I know like in a regular work setting, you get three days off, <laughs> like benevolence time or whatever, three, five days off, but then they want you to be good because you got to get back to your life. But if we think about like I lost my grandmother last summer and we're coming up on the one year anniversary and it has been a hell of a year. Every month that we get closer to that, I know if we just get over this one year hump, it's not going to get easier, but it'll get better. Yeah. And so like, even when we think about trauma and anniversary dates and we were talking about today on clubhouse, how like our body holds dates, like you may not remember that this happened on May 26, 2020, but your mm -hmm. body does. And it will tell mm -hmm. on you and, and right away, it will send yeah. out signs and, and have you all activate and everything. So all that to say that, I don't know, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> being aware of your body, trusting yeah. your body to grieve the way that it needs to grieve, all important, all important. Yeah, we'll need to do that. So to recap... Our steps to healing starts with awareness. And actually, I wanted to read, you haven't get this book, The Body Keeps the Score. Um, I have not read it all the way through because there's just so many things that like I'll highlight and then something will happen and I'll go back and like read things because it's just one of those things that you have to, there's so many truths that you have to keep reminding yourself. Yeah. Um, and as we spoke earlier, that trauma is held within our body. It is... It can get trapped in there and it affects our nervous system. It can affect our, <laughs> I mean, just so many things. When you mm -hmm. think of like, you know, heart issues, autoimmune, you know, just so many things we have to ask ourselves, is this a result of trauma? Is this trauma trying to be released within my body? It says practicing mindfulness calms the sympathetic nervous system. That is that you are less likely to be thrown into fight or flight. Learning to observe and tolerate your physical reactions is a prerequisite for safely revisiting the past. So as you think back mm -hmm. to the things that have happened to you, we have to be able to be aware. Um, like, you might feel like your heart is racing as you think back to this awful memory. You might feel like, you know, you just feel unsafe in your surroundings, even though you're in your safe home, but your thing, your mind will immediately go back to that place. So being self-aware, being mindful, seeking out resources that can help you, whether it's books, podcasts, preferably a therapist, <laughs> preferably a therapist, preferably a therapist that specializes uh, in trauma recovery um, that will help you help walk you through those things. You can hire Wendy Olson as well. She's an awesome healing coach and specializes, specializes in trauma. Um, and if you are of faith, um, really, you know, through prayer, through meditation, um, you know, because I know in times when I feel like I'm being triggered about something, I have certain scriptures in my toolbox, you know, and I'll just meditate on those things to kind of regulate, help, help my body or partner with my body to regulate by the renewing of my mind. I love that you brought that up because I have a scripture. Um, like when we're talking about the grieving and, and like the, the, the naming of the, of the harm that's been done to us, right? Um, we're wondering if we can ever like, like we don't want to go in the hole because we worry that like we're just going to sit in that hole and never be able to claw our way out. But mm -hmm. in Ezekiel 37, the spirit walks um, him through the valley of the bones. And he says, mm -hmm. he brings me out to the wilderness and he meets me there. He's mm. telling us that if we go, not only will he meet us there, but he'll go with us. Yeah. And if you have a faith 
then you have to have hope. Absolutely. Because faith is easy, but hope is resistant. It's daring and it's much harder to hope than it is just to have faith. Yeah. Because it's, you have to know that things will get better, even when they look like, <laughs> like it's dark. I don't see a light at the, I don't even, I don't even, can't even find a tunnel. I feel like. I got no light. I got no flashlight. Yeah. I got nothing. But you hope, I think there's a scripture that says you hope against all hope. And so we have to just believe that we will climb, we will climb out of that hole and things will get better. Um, so and that we like, deserve better. That we deserve better. better. Yes, knowing our value, knowing our worth. And again, it's not about shame that we went through something. We cannot control the things we've gone through, the things that God has allowed. I know a lot of people blame, blame God for things, but we have to push all that aside because the step to healing is not through um, shame and conviction and condemnation. It is just through awareness. It is just to say, I accept this. This is my story. So let me dive deep into how did it affect me? Let me dive deep into um, what is a result of it? How is it affecting my body? How am I triggered? Hmm. And then sit in that and then get the tools and the resources to climb out of it. Any last thoughts before we... I think you touched on this, but I just uh, want to reiterate too that like you should not share your story of harm with anybody, anybody as in just some random person or your cousin or your uncle or whatever, maybe even your best friend, because they may not be able to contain and hold your story well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need a safe person. You need a safe therapist too. Not every therapist is great either. Mm -hmm. You need someone that you can trust. Uh, you need someone that knows and will meet you where you are um, and that will hold your story well. Yes. You have to find someone who has the capacity to hold that. I know I mm -hmm. had a friend who went through an abusive um, marriage and the people she went to at the church was like, that's not abuse. Like, but did he hit you? Mm -hmm. But did he hit you? Ma'am, there's more than just physical abuse. What are yes. you talking about? Um, Which is do you know why sometimes worse. Are you watching people get it? And so I had to sit with her and go alongside her in her healing journey and say, those were not the people that had the capacity to lead you towards healing, but you were abused. And I need you to be comfortable in saying and acknowledge that it was abuse. Yeah. You know? Um, and over time, she able to was able to own that, um, and, and and then the healing began. So yes, we have to find someone who can hold hold that space for us. Well, I thank you. You know, we can go on and on, and on about this topic because we have <laughs> so true. But I appreciate your knowledge and your wisdom. Listen, guys, if you need a healing coach, someone who can hold space for your trauma who is certified in uh, story work and owning your story and getting to the root of behaviors and habits that stems from trauma. Wendy J. Olson is your girl. She is awesome. She is a Christian, but she brings so much more. She brings so much knowledge and information and wisdom um, to her sessions and tell people where they can find you. Um, you can follow me here on Instagram at Mrs. Wendy J. Olson, O-L-S-O-N. Um, that's where I mostly hang out is Instagram. And then I make fun videos on TikTok as well. Um, fun as in, I, let me tell you what trauma is. Um, cause I find yeah, it fascinating. She's, like, she's dancing and she's talking about trauma on TikTok. Okay. <laughs> that's, it's a good, I want to see you do the world or anything. It's, it's a good time. It's a good time. Um, I'm on Clubhouse. You can visit my website, which is she's got gumption.com. Uh, there's information about our nonprofit and then, um, coaching and speaking and all kinds of things all over there. So yeah, find me there. Awesome. Well, thank you, Wendy. Thank, thank you, you for those who are 